Hello and welcome to Inside Exercise. I'm Emeritus Professor Glenn McConnell from Victoria University in Australia. And I'm also currently a Danish Diabetes and Endocrine Academy visiting professor at the University of Copenhagen. The idea behind Inside Exercise is to bring to you the absolute who's who of exercise research. So exercise physiology, exercise metabolism, and exercise and health. And what I'm really wanting is for you to get your exercise information from the research experts rather than from influencers. And indeed, today I bring to you Professor Sue Bodine from the Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation in Oklahoma, USA. She's an expert on muscle, and in particular, what determines muscle size. So we know that resistance training increases your muscle size, which is hypertrophy. And we also know with aging, you tend to lose muscle size, so muscle atrophy takes place. So we talked about how much of the reduction in muscle size with age is due to the aging per se, and how much is the inactivity. We also talked about whether you can slow the rate of muscle size loss, so the rate of muscle atrophy, by doing resistance training, and also whether endurance training can slow the rate of muscle loss. We also discussed whether nutrition can affect the rate of muscle atrophy with age, and also talked about the importance of other things other than just muscle size and strength. So for example, with age, the importance of balance. I found it really interesting. I think you will too, so stick around. You'll see in the notes that I've included timestamps. So ideally, I'd prefer if you watch the whole podcast to get the full context. But if you wanted to skip around a little bit, you can on YouTube go down and click on the times and you can see what we've talked about and it will jump straight to that point. And also on uh, other platforms such as Spotify and uh, Apple Podcasts, you will see the times, but you can't click on them. If you'd like to do me a favor and help get the message out about Inside Exercise, then any sort of subscribing, liking, leaving comments, et cetera, on YouTube helps with the algorithm suggesting inside exercise to people when they're doing their searches. Okay, so thanks again and enjoy the podcast. Hi, Sue. Welcome to Inside Exercise. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for the invitation, Glenn. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Okay, so we're going to be talking about um, aging, inactivity, atrophy, and exercise. But what I like to do at the start is just sort of ask people, um, how do they get into this sort of exercise research? Were they like a sports person initially or an exerciser? They thought, oh, I could actually work in that. Or were yeah. you, you know, were you a, a re researcher and then and then moved into exercise? How did you do, do that? Um, well, so, I mean, in high school, I was, a, was an athlete. So I went to um, UCLA as an undergraduate and was a kinesiology major. So that's sort of how I got mm -hmm. introduced to it. Um, Reggie Edgerton was my, ended up being my PhD advisor, but I, I really, I was interested, I got very interested in movement and what controls movement. And obviously in the kinesiology major, we had classes in exercise physiology. And, and so that's sort of how I got into it um, mm -hmm. by accident, as far as research, I wasn't planning on, on going into research when I started as an undergraduate, but really fell in love with it. So did you do like a master's with Reggie or? or, or I did a master's degree initially. Yeah. So I did a, a master's degree. Um, I started off actually as a, a sort of um, focusing on biomechanics and then did a study with um, in Reggie's group in looking at muscle function and, and really enjoyed it. And so then I switched over to him as a as a graduate student and then UCLA at the time didn't have a PhD program in kinesiology. And then just as I was finishing my master's, they started one. And so um, I applied to a number of graduate schools, but decided to stay at UCLA with Reggie. And, um, and at the time he had a, a big program project in spinal cord injury and so started studying muscle. <laughs> oh, okay. And is that how you started looking at um, muscle atrophy as well, I guess? Actually, I started, that's how I got interested in motor units. Um, I started actually studying muscle atrophy when my, I moved to my first um, academic position was at UC San Diego and I was studying peripheral nerve injury. And so I actually was interested in what happens, you know, how the nerve regenerates and then makes contact, how the axons make contact with muscle and then started looking at the muscle and looking at the effects of denervation and that's sort of how I moved more into muscle atrophy. Mm. But, 
Okay. Well, initially, oh. I was more neural control of movement before that. Ah, okay. So like motor control sort of thing, yeah. Right. Actually, I haven't had anyone on talking about that. We should do that. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. So if we start thinking, so I think I guess aging is going to be a big, big focus of this. If we start thinking about um, why do people lose strength with age? We just talk about that generally, and then we'll sort of get into things. Yeah. Well, so, you know, strength is both a neural component and then also a muscle component. And I think the loss of strength with aging is related probably to two things. One is how the nervous system actually activates the muscle and whether it, there are issues there. And then also the muscle itself getting weaker or the muscle fibers themselves getting smaller. And so you have less muscle. And so strength goes down. Um, as you know, generally strength decreases more rapidly than actually muscle size. And I think that is related in part to the, the neural component of, of what produces strength. So it's not just how much muscle you have, but your ability to activate those muscles. Okay. So that's interesting because it's the same, I guess, when, and we'll talk about this, when you're actually uh, doing resistance training, you tend to get an increase in your neural, so your nerve sort of activation, and you get the increase in muscle size, and you know there's talk about the timing and all that sort of thing. So then, when you start to lose strength, it's it's the same sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, if you look at most resistance exercise, you know, training protocols or training, strength improves first, and then you start seeing increases in muscle size itself. And I think it's because the nervous system, when you do a, a movement, it's not just a single muscle that's being activated to produce that mo movement. And so the mus the nervous system learns how to more efficiently activate, you mm -hmm. know, an individual muscle and, and multiple muscles to produce that movement. And so you see improvements in muscle strength before you see... Okay. So if we talk about um, strength, and then when we talk about losses of strength with aging, what are, what time what time course are we actually talking about? You know, when we're saying losses of strength, is it fifty onwards? Is it thirty onwards? Is it seventy onwards? And it, and, it, and it's not necessarily linear. So if we think okay. about, you know, when do you increase your strength, and when do you start losing it? And this is without doing weight training, just just yeah, right. And I think it's it's highly variable you know, and it, so it depends on the individual person. So how, you know, what state they are, you know, what, what, how active they've been or are there other comorbidities, but in general, the data suggests that, you know, in middle age, around 50 or so, we start losing muscle mass and strength um, and it accelerates beyond 60 and, and then even further beyond 80. And so it's, like you said, it's, it may be gradual in middle age and you may not even notice it. And then beyond 60 is usually where in 70, where you see big, in, big, big decreases in strength and, and then you actually see significant muscle atrophy. Um, yeah. So if we could just talk about muscle atrophy, can we just talk about what actually starts happening? So, you know, is, are you losing, you already touched on the size of the fibers. But you're actually losing fibers as well. And and what about changes? If we could just talk a bit about how you have like fast twitch fibers and slow twitch fibers and, and whether that sort of changes with age as well. Typically, you see a loss of muscle fiber size. So individual fibers lose their cross-sectional area. And so the so there's not a, a loss of fibers per se. The the with advancing age and the onset of denervation, it's thought that now you start losing um, actual fibers. And so you have a loss of mass because of a, a decrease in the size of individual fibers, but also a loss of muscle fibers. But that can be variable. So, okay. Um, but is it the, the thing I was thinking about was uh, where you start to lose fast right. fibers and, and that the motor unit, the, the actual nerve, does it start to sort of jump onto the slow fibers? But, but you also lose some at the same time. Is that right? Right. So you have individual motor units, a muscle, you know, individual fibers are innervated by motor neurons and a motor neuron innervates a certain number of fibers in, in a muscle. 
with age and generally, so we have we have slow motor neurons and fast motor neurons. Slow motor neurons tend to innervate fewer fibers than the large fast motor neurons, which innervate large a, a greater number of fibers. Um, and so you have slow muscle fibers and you have fast muscle fibers. The the fast motor units or the tend to be in any given movement they are the last, there's a recruitment order of motor units. And so the slow motor units get recruited first and then the fast, the large fast motor units get recruited during very intense high resistance exercise. So mm -hmm. with aging, what you see, you tend to see is these large fast muscle fibers tend to, um, you, you lose the number, you you lose fast fibers, or I should say the fiber type Not composition a of a fiber of mm. a muscle becomes slower. And so it's because these fast muscle fibers are become denervated or th those motor units um, retract their, their axons. And then those muscle fibers become denervated, but then they become re-innervated and oftentimes by slow motor units. And so they become slow. So mm -hmm. there's this preferential loss of these large Fast. Fast motor mm -hmm. units um and so that and it's unknown you know people are still trying to understand why these motor units are the first to go um or mm. why are you losing these these motor units um i these i tend to think that these motor units are being lost one because they are the lat you know they're the most Res, um, they're only activated during intense exercise. And so mm -hmm. with aging, if you are, if we're doing less intense exercise, they may become more inactive and are seeing bigger changes. And, and that's resulting in the retraction of these, these axons to these muscle fibers. Um, but it's still unclear, you know, why, why you're losing these muscles these motor neurons and why these fibers are becoming denervated. And what happens early on is that you start maybe, maybe in middle age, you start seeing this denervation and re-innervation process. And with advancing age, what happens is that these muscle fibers become denervated and then they don't become re-innervated. And so if a fiber doesn't become mm. re-innervated, then that's when you start seeing fiber loss. And it's Fabulous. thought that, that process doesn't happen until very late. Um, so maybe that's, you know, let's say that's beyond 80 or something um, okay. that you actually start seeing loss of muscle fibers. Now, okay. that can change depending on other comorbidities. So, well, what about, um, what about if you wait, if you do resistance training? Can you put, and you, or, or sprinting? I mean, it's unlikely people are going to be sprinting, but if they did, you know, if you had 75 year old sprinters, you know, in the, mm -hmm. in the Masters games and whatever, if people look to see, or, or, you know, people that are doing fairly decent, you know, as hard as they can resistance training, if people look to see if there is any, any slowing of the loss of, of fast motor units and nerves? There has been some studies that have looked at, yeah, the fiber type distribution changes now in human studies, it's almost all been restricted to the vastus lateralis because that's where the biopsies, mm -hmm. um, whether it's slowing down that process, it's not clear, but there's some data to suggest that resistance exercise or even intense endurance, in, you know, um, aerobic exercise could maybe stabilize the process. And mm -hmm. so these and these motor units may not be motor neurons may not be retracting their axons. And so you can stabilize the neuromuscular junction, the connection between the axon and the muscle. Um, or it may prevent it, it may stimulate the reinnervation process. So, you, so it does, it can be beneficial. Um, oh, okay. and so there, there's thoughts that, that exercise, you know, both potentially aerobic exercise and resistance exercise can help delay this process and, and stabilize this, the, the neuromuscular junctions. That's interesting because you'd think in a way it's actually helping you to be more aerobic, more endurance. If you're getting, you know, not once you're 85 or whatever, and you start losing t total fibers, but if you're switching from 
more fast or slow, you'd think that would actually help with endurance type exercise when you're like 75 or something. But you're saying the endurance, if you do hard endurance exercise, you may actually slow that conversion. Or, or you may stabilize it, 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 intense exercise. So what you, you can see with intense ex aerobic exercise in the older individuals, you can see hypertrophy and it tends to be of the mm -hmm. slow muscle fibers, which are probably because they're the most highly recruited. Um, but it, I mean, aerobic exercise can have uh, benefits to muscle size in, in older individuals. But I think it the idea is that it also may slow down this process of, of motor neuron loss. And so you mm. stabilize these junctions. And so you may not be getting um, this denervation, re process, or maybe if you do get denervation, you're better able to re -innervate. Um, and so, um, okay. So okay. Oh, so you're talking about more the, the loss of fibers rather than the c converting. Okay. So just to summarize, make sure, cause I lost, lost, lost it there myself. I thought you were saying that if you did uh, resistance training and maybe high, uh, intensity endurance training, you might slow the, com the, the loss of fast motor units. So slow the conversion of fast to slow, but you're more saying, you might slow the loss of fibers that happen later on. Well, so both. I mean, I, I'm saying both that, yeah, the, okay. either both resistance exercise and aerobic exercise may may do the same thing. I mean, they mm -hmm. may stabilize. So you stabilize the junction, the the, yes. the junction between the axon and the muscle so that you don't get the denervation in the first place. And then you wouldn't get the fiber type conversion. Converting. Okay. Okay. Or, there's some, the other, it could also, maybe you still get some denervation, but then you can get re by other motor units so that you stable, you, you prevent this denervation the of, and the uh, loss of muscle fibers. Okay. It's still unclear. I mean, I think um, we know, I mean, you can, in order to stabilize these, these large fast motor units. I mean, we know what you do need to do is more intense exercise. You need to recruit them and they get recruited with high mm. intense or intense exercise or exercise that requires a, a higher force, a load. Um, yep. And so it's, it's necessary to recruit them to, to have a, an effect on them. Okay. So why don't we talk about the old classic of, of the, the loss of, muscle strength and size with aging, how much of it is inactivity? So I guess we've touched on that, but you know, how much of it is inactivity and how much of it is aging and can, and can you totally stop? Can you prevent it by exercise? <laughs> um, I think, I mean, it's a combination. I mean, I think it depends on the individual. Um, but what we do know is that, that, really even elite athletes long term athletes start losing muscle strength and and muscle size with age so there is an aging process um mm -hmm. that we haven't been able to completely stop we've been able to delay it um but so there's there's probably depending on the individual i mean i, I think inactivity is playing a role and especially inactivity of these large motor units these we're not doing as much intense exercise and so certain muscle fibers are are seeing much more inactivity than us other muscle fibers so mm. I, I think I personally think that inactivity is part of it um it it's not the only um mechanism underlying the aging process there's probably many more it's multifactorial so so if we're talking about um if, for example if you had and i know it must be hard to control but if you had, had an, an older person doing the same resistance training as a younger person which is would obviously not be the maximum for the younger person do you get the same adaptations or is it, there is this concept of anabolic resistance um, did you want to just talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, there seems the data suggests that there is this with aging, this resistance to 
to resistance exercise. Yeah, this attenuated response to resistance exercise. And mm -hmm. I think it does depend on age. Um, so some of the studies have shown, you know, that that there seems to like a 60 year old can respond as you get to 70 year old or 80 year old that there's less of a response or that it's harder. The adaptation is, is, is diminished. Um, so there, there does seem to be something going on with aging that's preventing this, um, the adaptation to this, this loading response to, to induce muscle hypertrophy. Okay. And if we, if, if we think about, um, What's actually going on there? I know quite often people think about hormones. So, you know, as you get older, um, you, know, you have lower testosterone, lower growth hormone. Do you want to just talk about that a little bit, um, whether that's the, the case or not? If that's Yeah, I mean, I, I, pers I don't think the data, I think hormones are obviously very important during adolescence and during puberty to promote growth. Um, in the adults, I don't think that testosterone or growth hormone per se are, are the primary factors regulating muscle size. I mean, obviously, if somebody has really, if a male has very low testosterone, um, that could be inducing some atrophy and weakness and supplementing them back to physiological levels is beneficial. Um, but super physi super physiological testosterone in clinical mm. trials doesn't seem to have done been able to prevent age related muscle loss um, or promote you know promote growth. Um, so I think they become hormones seem to be less important with age as far as maintaining muscle mass. Um, you know the the reasons for the attenuated response to to loading with age i i st think we still don't quite understand it i mean some have suggested that in response to resistance exercise you get this increase in protein synthesis and that with in older individuals that this increase in synthesis seems to be attenuated um that may or may there's data on both ends saying it may happen or it may not um, the other process that we've been looking at, um, with my, my colleague, Ben Miller, are that, you know, you may activate protein synthesis, but then something in the muscle, the ability to assemble those proteins correctly into new contractile apparatus may be impaired somehow. So even though you're synthesizing proteins, you're not able to put them together correctly to get functional muscle. And so something in the muscle that that's that this this protein turnover and assembly process is impaired with aging and that we need to figure out how to improve that um, in order to get better response. Yeah, that's very interesting. So some people would know I already had Benjamin Miller on and right. um, <laughs> and yeah, he talked about he, he's got some data. I think it's a little bit uh, contrary. You know, some people were, as you said, you know, not too short people aren't too sure what's going on but he actually said there was some evidence that it, that with aging you may even have higher protein synthesis rates to sort of compensate yeah. right well and in animal models we i mean with in with age you actually see resting protein synthesis is actually higher in you know as you get a as you get older um and and even in response to uh when we do we do have models of disuse and then we allow the animals to to re to reload or to to have full weight bearing the their protein synthesis their response as far as protein synthesis is better the old animals have a better response than the young mm -hmm. animals so the idea that protein synthesis is somehow the ability to activate protein synthesis is impaired we're not seeing that um suggesting that it's not just a, a matter of making the proteins it's it's much more complicated in how those proteins are then put together you know are they when they're made are they set are they folded properly um are they assembled properly um 
with other proteins to form, you know, a contractile apparatus. So is it also possibly, because I guess I was thinking that have higher protein synthesis and maybe higher breakdown, but you're saying it, it it's more likely maybe it's the, they're not being assembled properly or something like that, or it might be higher breakdown as well. Yeah. I mean, we've, I mean, some people have suggested that the, with, you know, with the muscle loss with aging is because it's all about increased protein breakdown. And, and there's actually some data to suggest that certain types of breakdown may in fact be impaired. Um, and so proteins may not be, they're not being turned over properly and, and degraded. And so they're actually accumulating in muscle and, and that's causing these aggregates are causing a problem. So protein degradation per se doesn't, I mean, in some of our animal models and even in humans doesn't seem to be going up as much as high as people say suggest it is. So it's much more, I think it, the, the problem is much more complicated than to say mm -hmm. it's much more complex than to say, okay, protein synthesis is down and protein degradation is up. Um, it's not that simple. And it may yeah, be yeah. that certain proteins may have a higher synthesis and some may have a higher breakdown, but overall it's not like it's, you know, it's all one or the other. So I, I think mm -hmm. the, the field needs to start looking at more individual proteins and what's happening with those individual proteins than just, you know, looking at bulk protein synthesis. That's true. Because people, and it's also easier to measure protein synthesis than breakdown as well, isn't it? So right. people <laughs> often do the overall protein synthesis, right? And you're right. saying some proteins might be up, some might be down. Okay. Right. So we just go to a um, Twitter question here for Mark. How long time periods of physical activity do you see increased health risk? So he's saying, how long uh, do you think you need, uh, if you're physically inactive before you sort of see health health risks, and um, what degree of exercise can compensate for that? So he's saying if you've got a busy work period, pregnancy, maternity leave, toddler, right, whatever, right. can you do like one session a week? So you know, Just say if you're normally active and then you become physically active. Is one session a week enough? Do you need to do more than that? I guess it depends what you're doing. Right. I, yeah. The exercise prescription is not so simple. Um, I mean, when we, we talk about inactivity and this, you know, acute atrophy in response to inactivity, it's usually something really severe. Like, you know, you go into bed rest for two weeks, you know, mm. or, or you're, you're immobilized, your limb is immobilized, you tear your ACL and you're, immobilized for for two weeks you see this rapid um inactivity um or rapid muscle loss aging process is the mm. loss of muscle mass as a function of aging and inactivity is is much more prolonged so yeah i mean if you um and and the other thing we know is that to maintain muscle mass with respect to resistance exercise it doesn't take a lot so, I mean, 30 mm. minutes of intense, you know, resistance exercise three days a week is enough to, you know, maintain or build muscle mass. So I think, you know, even just walking, um, if it depends on, you know, what your baseline is, where you, what mm. kind of exercise you were doing before, um, you know, so if you were lifting weights and if you were doing resistance exercise a lot, um or running a lot and then all of a sudden for two weeks you do nothing you don't you know yes you're going to lose some of your performance capacity um but you can you know it's you can definitely recover it um so i i think it's it's none of us are you know under the scenarios that this that mark described you're not totally inactive you're still walking around you're still doing some activities mm -hmm. um it's not like you're you're um, you know confined to bed and and not not doing any kind of resistance exercise yeah i'm glad you actually brought up those sort of models because i i sometimes um wonder about that so you know if they're looking at muscle atrophy as you say Quite often they'll do a study where you've got your arm in a cast or, or bed rest, which is pretty extreme. I'm bed rest in particular is pretty extreme. Often they have your head down and, and you right. can't even get out of the 
bed to go to the bathroom and all that. And you, and you sort of wonder, um, you know, how relevant that is to, to what, you know, obviously to aging, it's not particularly relevant or are the same sort of mechanisms going on, but just faster, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting what you see in response to, you know, in a otherwise healthy individual with inactivity um, is actually slightly different than what you see with aging. And so um, as far as what types of fibers atrophy and what muscles, so like with inactivity, um, bed rest, um, we do, you know, cast immobilization, like the soleus will, will, which is a predominantly slow muscle will atrophy rapidly. With aging, the soleus is actually one of the muscles that's more resistant to, mm. to age-related muscles. It's postural. Mm. It's postural muscle, um, and so, so you using see, it. like we just talked about. We see these large, fast motor muscle fibers atrophying first. So it's it, there's there's mm. some interesting mm -hmm. differences between like aging and then when you have these disuse that's acute true. disuse models. Um, you know, even when you look at astronauts who have gone into space and the type of atrophy they see is more like inactivity or disuse. Um, yep. So it's, 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 inter it's their differences. And, and I think in also, I mean, the aging, the muscle loss due to aging is a much more, much slower process. Yep. Now it can be accelerated by various diseases like diabetes or, or, you know, a very sedentary lifestyle, um, but. Yeah, yeah, I want to clarify that um, I'm not saying that um, casts or bed rests or whatever are not good good models. They're obviously a good model if you're looking at space, you know, what happens in space and things like that. But I guess sometimes when people are doing experiments, you want to have something, you know, that you can see quickly rather than, you know, like months and years of uh, um mm -hmm. Well, and I think it gets to one of, the, I mean, I've studied different atrophy models and aging being on the one spectrum that these models, you I mean, tell us different things, you know, and, mm. and that atrophy isn't a single process. Um, but, you know, immobilization, muscle atrophy due to immobilization is, happens to a lot of people and is, is important. And so we want to you know, try to understand what happens. Can we prevent that atrophy or can we accelerate the recovery um, in response to that atrophy? And in the aging context, it becomes important too, because if you have a period of acute immobilization in an older individual, and that person now has mm -hmm. this rapid atrophy, if they can't recover that now you know, puts them at risk for, you know, uh, for falling or other things. So you want, to, it, it accelerates their age-related muscle loss. And and so now that becomes an important problem, you know, to be able to build up, to to build back that muscle after an acute bout of, a bout of um, atrophy. Yes. yes, of course. So bed rest isn't just a good, a good model for space. It's a good, it's a good model for bed rest. So yeah, if you get... <laughs> For all sick, those people, <laughs> or you're injured and you're actually in bed, then yeah. So I know I've seen the data, which I think you're just touching on. That if you look at like muscle strength losses or muscle mass losses, it sort of goes down, sort of linear, maybe linear, linearly ish. But then if you're, you know, if you get sick, you know, and, and then you then it drops, and you don't necessarily get back. You know, you've really got to get. And, and I guess your average person that's just aging normally and is not doing a whole bunch of exercise they have that drop um, when they've just spent a few weeks in bed or whatever sick and they, they don't go back again, do they? They've got to, you, you actually, yeah. No, many of them don't fully recover back to their previous baseline, which may have been lower. Um, and so that just, you know, accelerates their, their decline or, or makes them less mobile, um, which then, leads to this whole, you know, spiral of inactivity and accelerated muscle or mm. loss of strength and muscle. So is it fair to say then that, you know, we, we want people to be doing, um, you know, resistance training, endurance training, it, the whole gamut, but it's especially important after you've had a period of bed, bed rest or you've been inactive for 
that mm -hmm. yes, if you've had a something an acute bout of in a, you know that's uh, acute bout of disuse that's caused you to to have muscle atrophy, you definitely need you know weight uh, resistance exercise and 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 rehabilitation. And I think that's where many people don't get the rehabilit mm -hmm. the rehab that they need. And, and the intense, they, they don't get the intense rehab. And so, mm -hmm. you know, they may just get mobile and can walk around, but to really build back that strength, they need some intense resistance exercise. And, and I think in many cases that's lacking in our, in our healthcare system. Yeah. I could imagine, I could imagine that's the case. Cause if you broke your leg or something, it's, it's, it's like that you'd be in the hospital system and, and then you might have some re so, you know, a physiotherapist or physical therapist, I think you call them over there, um, you know, telling you to to do, but even then they might just be, you know, if it's your knee or something, they might just be working on the knee, but not really working on your overall muscle mass and loss of endurance, you know, of a And even, and you know, in a, in a young, healthy individual, you know, recovery, I know I, I tore my ACL and was immobilized. I mean, it took, mm -hmm. In a couple of weeks, I lost significant muscle mass and it took months to recover that. And so that's in, in somebody that's healthy and doing rehab versus, you know, the, your average person. And so, I mean, it can it can take a significant amount of time and whether people, you know, stay, do, yeah. do the exercises they need to do. And I guess they wouldn't, you don't always think about, you know, you think about working on that leg you've damaged but you're not thinking about the fact that you've been in mobile you know more generally as well and and also if you've been in bed with covid or the flu or you know whatever it is you've had some illness it's not usually front of mind you know for the person or the doctor to say okay now you're back up and at, you know, up it's very important to go and exercise i don't think that's yeah it doesn't seem like that's well, front of that's mind. oftentimes yeah if you've had some severe illness and you've lost a lot of weight a significant part of that weight loss is muscle mass and we don't, don't think mm. about it you know we think of weight loss as fat mass and so you've lost muscle and mm -hmm. so we know you know you have to rebuild that strength and rebuild the, that muscle mass too and and we don't always think about that hey can i ask you a different a different sort of question so you know like distance runners and, and cyclists so you know tour de france cyclists they, they have like very weedy upper bodies right and which is actually a good thing because you don't want to be carrying extra weight if you're a serious runner or cyclist do you do we know if that atrophy because you know we've been talk, sort of talking about inactivity and aging where you sort of atrophy, you, you're losing muscle kind of equally everywhere sort of thing you know relatively um do we know what's going on there is it just because they're not using it that they're losing it or is there some sort of redistribution going on do you know i suspect that it's that is because they're just not using it. They're not, I mean, they're, they're not doing any kind of strength exercises and they're trying to probably keep their weight down too. And so it, it's advantage for performance under in that task to have a, have, have less muscle mass upper body. So exactly. But there's so, no sort of, cause you know how you get increases in cortisol and reduces and, you know, you can get changes systematically, systemically. So cortisol can break down protein. If you if you're like training, cycling hard, running hard, you might have an increase in cortisol, decrease in testosterone ratio, and things like that. For a while there, you know, I, I think there was some thought that, that might be playing a role in reducing the size of muscle that you're not using. But but I guess it goes back to what you said earlier that that I guess once you're you know past your adolescence and a young adult, it's not really hormones that are probably playing a role in that. So. Yeah, unless I mean, even I I doubt it's the cortisol that's that's inducing the that they're getting selective muscle atrophy. I I suspect it's just it's it's um, specificity of exercise. You know, exactly it makes more sense. I, mean, I know cyclists have problems with osteoporosis and bone mm -hmm. strength. But, um, yeah, no, it's funny actually. I think that was a prevailing view, or it was my idea at one stage. I was thinking how. So when you're exercising, you've got local growth factors and local activation of protein synthesis and all this sort of stuff. And then the ones you're not using are probably like getting chewed up because of the high, because I know we were doing an overtraining study and everything was cortisol, testosterone balance and all that. So, but I think that's all gone out the window. 
yeah. so I'm happy to to go with you on that one. Um, <laughs> so uh, Mark has another question here, if you don't mind, on Twitter. What is the minimal dose? Well, I guess we've talked about that. But the, he said minimal dose of exercise resistance slash endurance that perver- preserves healthy, healthy aging. Uh, the one there, I guess we've touched on that. You've, um, but you, you did mention earlier that endurance, even in, in older people, you wouldn't necessarily think of that, but endurance can actually help maintain your your muscle uh, fiber size. Yeah? Did you want to just talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, there there are some studies and I think it's, I mean, it's the intensity of the endurance exercise, but if you do, you know, intense, so above 70% VO2 max, um, you can see um, improvements in muscle size and fiber size. It's predominantly the slow fibers, which I think are, it's probably because they are the most heavily activated, but you, you mm-hmm. can have, you can see um, improvements in, in, um, or see fiber hypertrophy with endurance exercise. If it's That's interesting. You know, at yeah. a higher intensity, and I, and I think it's probably because, especially in an, you don't see it in a younger individual per se, yes. but an older individual. And I think it's just because you're it's seeing this significant increase in activity. You're recruiting mm. these fibers that you haven't been recruiting. And so you're, you're seeing this, this increased both activation and load on these, on these muscle fibers and they're responding by increasing their size. Um, yes. So like you're saying there, so it makes sense if you're an endurance athlete, young, young, where you haven't got this atrophy of fibers that are getting smaller, they they don't tend to change size. But if you're older and your fibers are getting smaller, which is a normal process of aging, right. you can slow that or prevent that by actually activating well, those and, fibers. And also, I mean, most of these studies in humans have tended the, you know, the subjects are selected to be sedentary. So you're taking a, you know, relatively sedentary individual and you're increasing their exercise significantly. Um, And so they're seeing a positive effect. Now, if you took a healthy, active, older person, it may take more to get them to hypertrophy. Um, Mm -hmm. But I think this is this, you know, people want, what is the minimum dose? I I don't know that Mm -hmm. we know that. And I think it, it also depends on you know what your starting point is so if you've been relatively active you know healthy you know nutrition you're not severely overweight you've you've generally been active that you may have a different prescription than somebody else you know um a very sedentary individual um you know um may be quite different the other thing is I was just at the gym myself and I, I always think if you just say to someone, uh, if you just say, oh, going to the uh, gym and doing resistance exercise for 30 minutes, you know, a day, the, it depends what you actually do at the gym. I spend most of my time <laughs> thinking, no, I won't go on that machine because it's the person sitting there checking their phone. So I'll, I'll go there and do that exercise and I'll come back later and see if they've, so, you know, this, it depends what you're actually doing at the gym. You know, are you actually kicking butt? And working out hard, or you're actually just doing a set, checking your phone, looking in the mirror. It's it's right. <laughs> it's you know, like and I remember I remember I saw a woman once at the gym and she was on a recumbent bike and she was pedaling. Like I can't people on YouTube will see this, but people like it was it must have been about you know 10 reps, uh, 10 revolutions per minute. And just like really it wasn't like it was because it was so hard, it was just slow and just watching the television. And I can imagine her then. Saying, "Oh, I've been ex- I've been going to the gym every every day, and I haven't lost weight or whatever." But well, you're not actually doing anything. <laughs> you're not. You don't just go to the gym and it magically happens. You've got to actually work out. Right. Yeah. There is a it, intensity does matter. Um, I always like the you know the 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 bikes or even the, the ellipticals, and you know it has the different intense or different categories and you're like the fat burning and people pick that one mm. which happens to be the lowest intensity exercise oh I, but i've you know i've got i've got it on that's fat. true that's <laughs> true all right now this is one you may again from twitter just i just i encourage people to send questions so adam 
Should athletes be concerned about being mostly sedentary for the rest of the day if they run or cycle for two hours of the day? So that's the old thing about, you know, I, so I used to ride to work and back. So it was about, I don't know, 22 kilometres each way. So I don't know, that's 14 kilometres. You know, hard, because I'd usually be running late and then ride home hard because I'm running late picking up the kids or something. But then I'd be sitting around all day. So the old right. chestnut, and I know this isn't your main area of research, but um, any thoughts on that? I mean, I would say, no, you shouldn't, you know, be worried. And, and the fact that you're doing that, plus I think people forget about that a lot of the adaptations, I mean, after you stop exercising, you're still, you know, your resting metabolic rate, everything is still high. And there's a lot is going on during those recovery periods. Um, and so, and you need those recovery periods and, you know, you're not being totally during those periods. If, if, if you're exercising two hours through four hours a day, it's not like you're totally inactive during those other periods of time. So, um, I would not yeah. be, be worried. I think he was saying two hours a day, but yeah, four hours a day, I think yeah, he would be too worried. <laughs> Um, now, the other thing I just wanted to think about sort of practicalities. So if you've got an older parent or a grandparent who's, who's been inactive, um, you know, what do you suggest? Because, you know, it's tempting to say, oh, you know, grandma, go to the gym three days a week and do weights and, and then the other three days do endurance. And, you know, that might be the, the best case scenario. Right, right. But how, how do you think, what, what would you actually be prioritizing? You know, because you mentioned walking earlier. Um and you mentioned falls prevention as well. Now, these are things, you know, anyway, what would you suggest if yeah. someone said that? I mean, I, I think like getting out and just walking, you know, and even if you have a neighborhood that has some hills and stuff, you know, you're going to get some resistance exercise and, and increased intensity if you can walk up the hills. Um, so if, it, you know, if it's not just flat, but just getting out and exercising, I think, like you said, I mean, a lot of the other thing that goes with aging that we don't think about so much is balance. Um, and, you know, there are exercises that you can do at home for balance. You can even, you don't have to, you know, even little things like resistance bands or other things that you can get some, you know, resistance exercise with if for your grandma or even some free weights. And even if they're small um, mm. to, you know, to get your, the elderly parents to, to be doing some resistance exercise. Um, but, you know, a lot of it is, uh, is just, just get up and move. <laughs> um, exactly. And, you know, not sitting yeah, so, around all day. So like trying to walk more often and make it, you know, part mm -hmm. of the normal life. Um and, and, you know, rather than sort of suggesting go to the gym or whatever, have, have like you said, band, bands to have at home or, or some little barbells or something, yeah. Right. And, and do you yeah. know aged care centres, do you know if how well they're doing with that? Um, I mean, there are, you know, there are, I don't know, other countries, like, you know, there's more active, um, active living um, residences that have a lot of, you know, courses, classes, fitness classes for elderly there, you know, some communities do a really good job of having community fitness um, and programs. But I, I think it's probably depend, you know, it, it's highly variable across communities. Um, some do mm -hmm. better jobs than others. Um, yeah. But, now, I saw you had a paper, Effects of Diet. We haven't really talked much on diet, I guess. Effect of diet, composition, and chronic obesity on muscle growth and function. It made me think, um, you know, it's quite often there's people who are interested in protein, protein supplements and things. If you're inactive and aging, you know, and then getting older, do things like any any protein supplements, anything you eat really make any difference or do you need to be doing I, I know, I know we, we'd prefer them to be doing exercise, but is there any evidence at all that anything you eat can like slow the rate of loss of muscle? Well, I mean, well, good question. Um, I mean, if chronic inflammation is thought to be, you know, contributing to age-related muscle loss or other aging 
factors. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if diet can in influence, you know, inflammation, obviously that would be that that would be positive to, um, or I mean, obviously insulin resistance, diabetes can mm -hmm. negatively impact. So maintaining, you know, proper glucose homeostasis, all of these are important. Protein per se, I mean, I think the data, I think you want to have adequate levels of protein and with aging, whether, you know, if you're, if you're not getting enough protein in your diet, I think it's important, but I, I don't think the data had, you know, the protein supplementation mm -hmm. above and beyond the daily record, you know, what's recommended, I don't think is ha been shown to have yeah. any positive effects. Um, so, you know, I, I think you need to be doing some kind of resistance exercise coupled with, you know, having adequate protein. Adequate to get, protein. To have yeah. yeah. So if you don't have adequate, obviously, um, getting supplement or, you know, increasing. But most, I guess yeah. most do, right? So, which is what you're saying. Um, so, yeah, I've had Stu Phillips on uh, and he he made it pretty clear that, um, you know, you didn't have to be sort of worrying as much as people tend to worry about with protein. But I guess there is some evidence is there that that um, as people age, they maybe need more and not, don't get as much or I'm not sure. I don't know. If they, um, yeah, I think there's some evidence that people are not getting adequate protein um you know and some some with aging you know their their um what's the word i'm looking for they're not anorexic but they're they're the amount of food they're eating is lower they're not eating it much. Mm -hmm. um they're not eating as much and they may not be eating as much protein as they need um so i think you know making sure that people are getting you know the the recommended amount of protein is important yeah um, but for most Americans, uh, exactly, you know, protein intake is not a, a major problem. Exactly. Well, that's the uh, thing. I was yeah, because people tend to think, oh, I'm going to put on, I'm going to go to the gym. I want to put on muscle. I need to have all this extra protein when they're probably getting enough already. And then <laughs> oh, now I'm missing. Now I'm losing muscle as I'm getting older. Oh, what's muscle made of? Protein. Okay, I need protein. more protein. But it's really ninety nine percent or ninety five percent of what it's go go and actually do the exercise. Yeah. Well, and for me, it's just like, yeah, that, I mean, just eating protein, the protein doesn't automatically go to your muscle and build muscle. I mean, muscle, muscle needs a stimulus to add protein, I mean, to build. And so that has, that's resistance, you know, having to, to exercise against a load that it can't lift. And so, and so, yeah, to build that muscle, you need adequate protein, but just taking more protein, the muscle is not going to, the body is not going to deposit it no. in muscle as, as, as increased fiber size, it's going to deposit it as fat, unfortunately. Exactly. Cause you need the, you need a signal, you need the, the muscle needs to go, Oh, right. I'm going to convert some yeah. DNA to messenger RNA to transfer RNA, go out and get the amino acids I need and then make the protein, you know, just. Right. eat protein and the muscle gets bigger <laughs> that would um, be nice <laughs> would be nice actually i just saw i actually copied and pasted one here i saw van loon luke van loon who's actually going to come mm. on the podcast he found resistance exercise training in older adults uh he compared 65 to 75 year olds with over 85 and he actually got similar increases which is interesting yeah. Uh, prolonged resistance exercise training, increased muscle mass, strength, and physical performance in the aging population with no difference between 65 to 75 years and 85 to, to plus years. I haven't had a look at that. I don't know if you saw that or not. But that's yeah, I, I haven't seen that paper. I mean, I know, you know, the Scott Trappy's group years ago showed how to study in women and he, they showed significant differences between 60 year olds and 80 year olds. So mm -hmm. I don't, and, you know, so I don't know um, what the exercise was, how long it was, you know. Um, the other thing is, I, I think when we're comparing some of these studies too, is what's the underlying um, uh, health of status of these individuals? You know, how sedentary have they been? Um, exactly. So you'd have they, to see the paper. Yep. Yeah, and we'd assume yeah. they train the same, which you'd have to assume that, but maybe they 
because I was thinking you'd have to train, I would have thought you'd have to train the older people harder to get the same adaptations, but um, I guess we're just speculating. Did you want to just... I don't know if they're male and yeah, I think there may be some sex differences too, but mm, I don't know true. What, what sex was, what they was yep. mixed. Yep. You've touched on this a couple of times, but I haven't really brought it together. Do, do you want to just talk a little bit about disease and how it can affect muscle mass? So, you know, you spoke about uh, people with diabetes, et cetera. Do you want right. to just flesh that out a little bit? Well, I think so, you know, maintaining muscle mass, I mean, and especially with age is, or, or many things can induce muscle atrophy. And so we know just, you know, that inflammation, we, we talked about disuse. So inactivity, um, both, you know, decreased resistance, extra contract contractions against load or just in, decreased contractions in and of itself. Um, nerve injury, um, which results in disuse, but, you know, inflammation can induce, um, can, can induce muscle atrophy, you know, high, high cytokine loads. And so, um, disease processes. So, you know, with aging, if you have other underlying disease processes, cardiovascular disease, um, can result in, in loss of muscle mass, diabetes. So all of these things, you know, renal failure, liver failure. So all of these can complicate or accelerate loss of muscle mass, you know, um, as even when added on to just aging process. So I think when we look at the, you know, population and people ask, you know, about they want a prescription or something for exercise or, you know, to what is the, what's the percent loss of muscle mass with age? I mean, it's highly variable. And I think mm -hmm. we need to understand the, you know, the underlying other underlying comorbidities or health status of these individuals. Um, because many, often many studies also, you know, they, they want relatively healthy sedentary individuals mm. they may respond really well but somebody that's not as healthier or on a number of different medications may not may not respond as well as a, a generally healthy individual exactly. so and, and even if you have a diseased uh, a population with a, a disease so like people with type 2 diabetes often you want them to to not be on medications or so like that so even when you're studying you're someone study, that's got a disease, yeah. you're not actually looking at the average person that has that disease anyway. Right. Yeah. So we've done studies looking at you know we've shown that glucose uptake during exercise is normal when people have type two diabetes. But then you think, well, they were just diet controlled. You know, is that the case if they're on you know metformin or if, or if they had high blood pressure as well, which is you know co-founder. Um, now I know you've done a lot of, and this is where um, I'll, I'll remind people that we have timestamps so you can look at the if you're on youtube you can look at the bottom and you can click on the times and then if you're on the other platforms you can see the times i know you've done a lot of work on mechanisms but if people don't want to hear about mechanisms they can skip this part <laughs> um, but i think it wouldn't be nice if you because i mean that's been a major thing so did, did you want to talk a little bit about uh what mechanisms you think are playing a role in muscle atrophy <laughs> <laughs> um yeah um so it started looking at mechanisms probably a little 20 about 20 years ago um trying to understand what's inducing muscle atrophy I, I think that what i've learned is that it's not simple it's complex and and that what the underlying mechanisms may differ depending on what the trigger is um so and and so like with use atrophy i mean we know that in the models we've used with acute atrophy, I mean, a, a decrease in protein synthesis can definitely contribute to muscle atrophy. Um, usually in many, especially if it's a, a, a rapid atrophy, it's a combination of changes in protein synthesis, but also changes in protein degradation. So activation of processes that increase the turnover of specific proteins. 
Um, and in, you know, in, in muscle, the critical proteins for turnover, are the contractile proteins. So breakdown of the myofilaments and um, is going to lead to muscle atrophy. So we've been, you know, so you, you have a, a combination of effects of, you know, certain proteins, these proteins are being, their synthesis is being reduced and, and their breakdown is being elevated. Um, it's not always that, that simple. Um, and you can have under atrophying conditions, you can have some proteins where their synthesis is increasing. And, and these may be proteins that are supporting elevated protein degradation. So you don't want those proteins being synthesized. Um, and then you have proteins that are being accelerated as far as their breakdown. And so we've been studying, you know, trying to understand what some of these mechanisms are and, and actually in, in the course of trying to understand synthesis, we started looking at mTOR, um, and, uh, did, you know, determined that, you know, activating mTOR with resistance exercise was important. And if you suppress mTOR activation, you get, you know, less, less hypertrophy. And that oftentimes with atrophy, um, mTOR can be suppressed, but there's probably other pathways contributing to synthesis that are being suppressed other than just um, mTOR, but mTOR has been the one that's gotten the most attention. And then on the degradation side, we've been looking a lot at activation of, um, so we identified two enzymes that are called E3 ligases um, that are part of the ubiquitin proteasome pathway. And, and so these E3 ligases add ubiquitin to proteins and, and, and usually add ubiquitin in, in chains to specific amino acids and that often and that usually targets these proteins for degradation but unfortunately it's not quite that simple <laughs> ubiquination doesn't always target proteins to to degrade um for degradation um but we've started un uncovering different um proteins that get elevated um and specifically these E3 ligases that get elevated during atrophy um, that seem to be associated with the atrophy process. Um, so the idea is if you could suppress the upregulation of these proteins or these enzymes, could you suppress atrophy? And in some cases we can, if we, if we, um, if we prevent these proteins from becoming upregulated, we can attenuate the atrophy process. Um, unfortunately it hasn't been easy to target these proteins for, um, to suppress them. So, I mean, that's been a, a question, a problem, um, you know, that okay. it hasn't, it, the, you know, trying to prevent muscle atrophy hasn't been easy Has it's has, has not been an easy target as far as, you know, what's the best way to do it. So. Unfortunately, so I wonder. I wonder if you're fighting sort of biology in a way because, <laughs> because as you age um, and you're not using your muscles, then it, you know it's it makes sense. So if if you're not if you're aging and you're not exercising, uh, then it makes sense. Why would you keep this muscle if you're not using it, sort of thing? So you know you're trying to if you fight if you're trying to come up with an agent to sort of you know reduce the breakdown of muscle, the muscle might just be going. Well, why would I be doing that? You know, like if you're not using it, you lose it. Yeah. Right. And that's, I mean, it with even these acute atrophy, you know, when you have disuse is, you know, a, a significant inactivity. I, I always, I, I think of muscle as a very smart tissue, you know, mm. maintaining muscle mass is very expensive. And so if you aren't yes. using it, why maintain it? And so the, the, the logical thing to do is get rid of it. And and just mm. not and then not you know break it down and and not recover it, um, or not rebuild it. And so you know under normal circumstances, these proteins get turned over all the time. But you rebuild you know you replace them because you're you're you you need that muscle. But what's interesting is is muscle under most atrophy conditions, as long as the nerve is still intact, the muscle will decrease in size, but it reaches a nadir and it doesn't go below that. 
And I've always been interested in, you know, somehow it knows, you know, stay, stay at a certain size, maybe so that you can move, but um, it doesn't keep atrophying. It, it goes down to a specific set point. Unless there's, that's, if there's no nerve intact, then it will continue mm. to atrophy. I was interested you said that, so mTOR, which is known to be stimulating protein synthesis, you said that goes down with inactivity. I can't remember if you said inactivity or aging, but I. But you also said earlier that, and, and ben, Benjamin Miller, that protein synthesis, if anything, goes up with aging. So I was wondering why mTOR goes down. Well, what's down interesting and... is mTOR is, is in these models of aging, mTOR is chronically active. And so um, so chronic activation of mTOR may be, it's suggested that chronic activation of mTOR is leading to this increased protein synthesis that we see with aging. Um, why, why mTOR is chronically, or how it's being chronically activated, it's not clear. Um, and in a normal muscle, what we know is so during like puberty, during rapid muscle growth, mTOR is high. Once you sort of reach, uh, you know, a, a stable muscle mass, mTOR rest muscle resting mTOR levels actually decrease, and they're relatively low in a healthy muscle that's not being, you know, loaded. And then with resistance exercise, it gets acutely activated, but then it comes back down. So. It appears that acute activation of mTOR is important for building muscle, but you don't chronic mm. chronic levels of mTOR seem to are neg are, are are not beneficial. And in models that have elevated mTOR activity in muscle, it leads to ch pro uh, changes at the neuromuscular junction and myopathies, and so. You want M, you don't want mTOR to be chronically active, um, and so that's sort of the the, wow. the this um, this ties in with so many other things. So you know, like insulin's chronically elevated when you're insulin resistant, and then you know now it's it sounds like you're saying you know when you're anabolic resistant, your mTOR, which stimulates protein synthesis, is, is chronically elevated, and how like if something's chronically elevated. It's not always the same as if it's acutely. So the same with reactive oxygen species. So I had Carlos, right. I always forget his surname. But yeah, if you have, with exercise, you get an increase in reactive oxygen species, you know, transiently, and then it goes down again. But if you've got right. chronically elevated reactive oxygen species, that's a bad thing. Right. And even, well, I, even I guess we you mentioned- about, We were talking about cortisol. Uh, I mean, with intense exercise, cortisol is activated, but it's not, it doesn't stay up. I mean, chronic mm -hmm. high levels of glucocorticoids cause muscle atrophy. But yeah. activation of cortisol during exercise doesn't generally induce atrophy. And so like mm -hmm. you said, yeah, it's the, it's how it's being activated and that it's not staying, you know, chronically elevated. Yeah. And it fits with what you're saying about inflammation as well, because there's some, it still does my head in, head in a little bit, but there's some evidence that, you know, acute exercise can be cause inflammation in muscle, but, right. but that, but then you've got chronic inflammation you're saying would cause, um, cause atrophy so it's, it's different Negative. yeah no yeah. and yeah it's it's you know it, it's all about the timing and 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 the act and you know the the L, the level of activation um that's right and, and is it how high does it go is it and then and sometimes also what other things are activated at the same time so it's usually not you know with 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 chronic systemic inflammation it's not a single um cytokine that's elevated it's multiple ones and so how they're interacting right all right um i think we've covered a lot of ground here is there is there anything you'd like to to bring out before i start doing no, my I wrapping we, up <laughs> i think we did yeah i think we've covered a number of topics all right. Um, one thing I like to do, I've started doing is, uh, you know, the, the main reason I start inside exercise is I want people to get their information from the experts rather than influencers. And I've just something I've started adding the last couple of times. Is there anything that's kind of out there that you find particularly annoying in your field that people are, you know, uh, are talking about or thinking that, that you, you think doesn't really add up scientifically? Well, I think one of the things I see, and I, I see it, it's even being taught sometimes in exercise physiology courses in, in to to undergraduates, is 
this idea that to build muscle, you have to break it down that, you know, muscle injury, you have to induce muscle injury in order to, to build muscle. Mm. And I, I would say that under most circumstances, I don't think that's the case that you you're when you do resistance exercise, you're not inducing this, you know, severe um, muscle injury, you know, uh, degradation, you know, and the, the muscle fibers are not degrading there. There may be some slight micro injuries there and, and, but the muscles mm -hmm. remodeling and, and yes, you have to, in order to remodel muscle, you have to activate protein degradation. And so protein degradation is not always a bad thing. You need a balance between degradation and synthesis to build muscle. But that under most, you know, it's not like we're regenerating muscle, you know, when we're building muscle in response to, re, um, to resistance exercise. Um, I guess that's one. Um, I think there's, you know, for a long time, um, this idea that w people talk about, we talked about muscle strength, we've talked about muscle, we didn't get into it very much as muscle quality um, you know, um, strength per muscle, uh, muscle mm -hmm. size or cross-sectional area. And we talk about decreasing quality and, and I think, or people talk about specific tension and in humans, it's hard to measure specific tension because you can't, you need a, you need a absolute, uh, precise measurement of force and you need a precise measurement of cross-sectional area. And you can't get that in humans. And so, you know, it's voluntary strength. It's voluntary um, strength. And maximum so maximum voluntary contraction. Maximum yeah. voluntary contraction. So it depends on the person's motivation. You're also okay. usually, you're measuring strength about a joint. So you're, it's not a single muscle we're talking about, you know, when we do mm. a, when we're measuring strength at the knee, it's multiple muscles. And then how do you accurately measure the mass that's producing that strength. And so, you know, it's a very relative term, um, but, you know, people make, are often, you know, I, I, I guess I quibble with the use of the word specific tension when when doing that measurement, it's, it's sort, of, sort of like it's normalized force. Um, and it gives you an okay. idea of, you know, is, is, the quality of the muscle going down as far as the ability of the, the inference is that somehow those muscle fibers can't produce this, you know, are, are somehow not producing their maximum force, but there's many things that could be going into that. So. Okay. So just to clarify for people, the specific tension, you'd be saying how much force and newtons or whatever per gram of muscle. And you're saying that's very hard to determine in humans because it's complicated yeah or any time in vivo even you know when you're I'm very glad you brought that up because i actually had that in my i don't know if you saw the dot points i sent you as a potential <laughs> discussion points that i did have in there strength per unit muscle but what i decided was i was, wasn't going to ask you that because i felt like we'd sort of covered that when you said that with a with age because you said you tend to get more slow fibers than fast so i thought well based on that you would expect to have less force per unit muscle anyway wouldn't you well so that gets yeah the this idea that slow fibers are inherently weaker than fast fibers and i think that when you the that gets that specific tension and when it's been measured you know in single fibers or even at the cross bridge level the difference between slow and fast fibers from the data I've seen is not significant. It's highly, it, they're very close and it can't oh. explain the big differences. For, so actually as part of my dissertation was at, trying to get at this because every, the dogma at the time was that mm -hmm. slow motor units were, were, you know, we knew that slow motor units produce less force than fast motor units. And the mm -hmm. dogma was that that was because slow motor units slow fibers are inherently weaker. Their specific tension is smaller. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, is that there's the force of a slow motor unit is lower than the force of a fast motor unit because 
the slow motor unit has fewer fibers. The the number of fibers innervated per mm -hmm. motor neuron is sl smaller. Oh, so okay. it's, it's a function of innervation and the number of fibers, nice not, not the not the inherent ability of slow myosin or oh. you know. So bridges. you're saying per per muscle fiber, you're saying the force is not because I always think of those, you know, the the twitch, the bigger twitches and slower twitches and flatter and all that with this sing. I thought that was a single cell, but are you saying that's a single motor unit? Well, no, it depends on what you're. I mean, you can get mm. a twitch of a single fiber. I mean, depend. You can measure twitch of a single fiber of a whole muscle. I mean, you can do. Mm. You can measure the twitch of a single motor oh, unit. So, it, I mean, you have to define. You're saying if you do a single fiber, if you do twitch or or you just titanic, you just do the max. There's no difference in force, force, really. Well, no. So, well, if they're the same cross-sectional area, yeah, a slow fiber and a fast fiber that are the same cross-sectional area, Section area are will produce uh, similar force. But now we're starting because fast fibers are bigger, aren't they? <laughs> Fast fiber, well, that's it. So fast fibers, mm. well, not all fast. Oh, okay. Not all. Got to do a whole another podcast on this one. <laughs> on fiber okay. type, but yeah, and in humans, actually, I mean, s slow muscle fibers are pretty big in some muscle. I mean, if you look in the mm. it, human data, it depends on the muscle. I mean, slow fibers can be relatively big, especially in the soleus. So I, I think. Mm. It depends on the muscle you're looking at, but this idea that slow fibers are inherently weaker, um, false. I mean, there, there's the data is variable, but most of it shows that if if there there may be a small difference, slow fibers might mm. be slightly weaker, you know, less force per cross sectional area, but it's not enough to account for some of these big differences we measure in force. So, okay. Well, it's interesting I, I, when you mentioned soleus again, I wanted to bring up that point because I thought it was really nice. You said with um, age, if anything, you you maintain your soleus um, strength better than some other muscles because they're so slow twitch and they're so important for posture. So, you know, you're using them still. But then if you go into space or you do bed rest, I guess because you've taken away that posture, then they atrophy more. I think that's really quite interesting. Yeah, yeah they, they tend to atrophy the the greatest under these unloading conditions right all right so is there anything just um is there anything you're excited about that we haven't talked about that you're working on at the moment that you want to bring out or um, have we kind of covered everything i think we've covered most everything really good all right so what i like to do at the end then is to have takeaway messages so um, what would you like people to take away from this chat um, well, with respect to aging, I mean, I think, um, you can, you know, aging, there is an inherent aging process that that's going to affect all of us, but we can slow it down. And I think, you know, maintaining a healthy lifestyle, which means, you know, being physically active, um, is important. And so to stay, you know, be it walking or whatever, um, you know, try to maintain a, an active lifestyle and, and that, I mean, resistance exercise is important. And so, however, you can get that, you know, be it, if you, you know, if you do belong to a gym and you can go to the gym three times a week and exercise, it doesn't take a lot of time. Um, but you can do it by other means too, at home with resistance bands, um, and, in other types of exercise. So squats, you can do it at home. Um, but, and then I guess the other, you know, with aging the, um, obviously with fall prevention, it, it's not just strength and mm. aerobic exercise. There's balance and balance. attention to, um, to that aspect of it. So actually, before we started, I said, I often do the takeaway messages. Then I think of something else. So I'm, I'm going to do that again. <laughs> thinking if some, if you've got someone who's never done any resistance training at, at all is it correct that you can still hypertrophy your muscles so they've even shown like 90 year olds and things is that is that I, correct so there's i yeah. believe so yeah. yeah i i think you know with the proper loading that you can get responses yeah it's never too yeah. late to start 
Um, mm -hmm. I would say that, but I would also say the earlier you start, probably the better. I mean, that that I am, I do believe that what we do as young adults has consequences later on. And so if you have kids, <laughs> encourage mm -hmm. them to be active. Um, and, you know, I think if you look at, you know, the rate of loss of males and females, I think that the rates tend to be higher, faster for men, but women hit that threshold sooner because we just have, most women have less muscle mass. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important um, for for women um, to definitely be doing resistance exercise. Next year, now I've got another one I had in my notes, but we never brought up. Females, why is it they don't hypertrophy as much? So if we're talking about it, you know, once you're an adult, um, it's mainly what's going on in the muscle. It's not so much hormones. Why is it that females do not hypertrophy as much when they do resistance training, Dina? I would say, I think the data, if you're comparing in adults, women and men doing the same, if they're, if you're controlling the resistance, the loading, their oh. percent gain is identical to, to men. So there's no, there's no difference in, in the ability of men versus women to hypertrophy um, from the data I've seen. Oh, and, I've got that one wrong then. So you mean if they do the same absolute or the same relative? Yeah. Um, well, not, they won't have the same app. So percent load. Yeah. You know, if they're working at their relative percent max, mm. I think the data shows women can hypertrophy. Now we're talking young adults, mm. uh, that the response is, is identical. Um, well, I totally yeah. did not know that. <laughs> yeah. I, well, that's, that's why we got to have these podcasts. Favorite. I'm not the expert. I don't sit around. Yeah. Some podcasters sit around <laughs> saying what they believe. Thankfully, I don't do that. I interview the experts. Yeah. So. No, uh, I, I think, yeah, women can. And so, you know, probably in the general population, I, I suspect women are just not working out at the same level, the average person, female mm -hmm. versus male. Um, okay. But All right. Well, thank you very much for coming on. Thanks for your time. And uh, see you around. Somewhere. Thank you. Hopefully. It was nice okay. chatting. Maybe the conference. Okay, thanks. See you. Bye. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. And please like, subscribe, pass it on to your friends and colleagues. Check out the other podcasts. Thanks again.